Um, anyone who knows me knows how excited I am to introduce our first speaker, um, Barbara Pfister. Barbara is the coordinator of instruction at Gustavus Adolphus College in Minnesota. Um, she has a bachelor's in Russian literature, an MLIS from the University of Texas, and an MA in English literature. Her research interests are many and varied, but as I read in some interviews somewhere, they're coherent, they, they cohere. Um, and they include informational literacy, popular literacy, and the future of publishing. She writes frequently on these topics. Her peer-to-peer -peer column is published in Library Journal, and she blogs at Library Babblefish for Inside Higher Ed. And somewhere, she found the time to write three mystery novels. <laughs> so, please join me in welcoming Barbara Pfister. and I, you can't hear me, let me know. Still okay? Okay. I'm not very loud, so I wanted to be sure you could hear me, but thank you so much for inviting me, and this was exciting for me because I'm a huge fan of Anne Marie's writing, so <laughs> this is a great chance to finally meet her and to catch up with some old friends, and um, special shout out to Amanda and Amy for sitting in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> This is really great to be able to come here and talk to you today. So um, what I wanted to start out with was thinking about um, a book that was written, published back in 1979 when Elizabeth Eisenstein wrote this influential book called The Printing Press as an Agent of Change, pointing out that many, many of these unexpected and, and kind of unacknowledged ways that the printing press changed things for people made it possible to preserve and share knowledge and to invite people who had not really been able to be heard to, be, to invite them in. And we're living through another change, time of change like that. Technology is changing the way that we think about knowledge. But today I want to think about ourselves as agents of change. I think uh, librarians have a lot more power than they give themselves credit for. Uh, I think we often fail to recognize our own power because we're so aware of, of power differentials and we're so committed to reducing powerlessness. Exerting power, claiming attention, and even expressing strong opinions sometimes seems at odds with our desire to serve and our commitment to providing information of all kinds without asking questions about people's motives. Yet asserting our power can be totally consistent with our values, and uncritically providing information, whatever the cost, can actually betray them. So today, I thought I'd talk about the metaphors that we use when we talk about what we do and what we might want to do differently. I want to think through the implications of these metaphors in terms of teaching and learning practices, and also about the role that, that librarians play in making and sharing knowledge. But since we're also talking about telling our stories out loud, I thought I'd start by telling a few of my own stories before we venture into this more abstract territory. So, let me put this down here. This is my clock in case I need it. So in high school, I took uh, an English class. Thank you, Mrs. Beard, wherever you are. Uh, this was one of those classes where you learn how to write a research paper, because you're going to college, you have to write a research paper. Well, she was really good at this, as it turns out. And we could write about anything we wanted, and I had just read Josephine Tay's The Daughter of Time. Some of you have read that. I was totally convinced Richard III was framed for murdering his two nephews. <laughs> totally convinced. And so that was going to be my, my research paper. And I wrote it up, and I handed it in my first draft. And she looked at this big pile of messy papers and read the first paragraph, and she said, no, this isn't research. You have to ask a question. I had been merely telling the history of Richard III according to his champions. <laughs> I had started with the answer, not with the question. So I started over, and with her encouragement, I found as many of the primary sources as I could from the time when Richard III was being framed. Uh, by the time I finished writing the paper, I decided actually he was probably guilty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, which was, was important for me because that was when I discovered research can actually change minds, including my own mind. In my first semester in college, I had a somewhat different experience, but unfortunately one that's probably pretty common. I took a philosophy course, and uh, we had to write a paper, and so people were writing about philosophers or about ideas in philosophy, and I thought that sounded boring. So I would write about this thing that seemed philosophical to me, but I didn't know what to call it, because I didn't really know anything about philosophy. So I didn't know it was called the mind-body problem. That was what I was kind of working on. Um, so when the day came uh, and he handed all the papers back, he went through and everybody got their papers back but me. And he said, Barbara, come see me in my office. <laughs> oh my god. So I went to his office and he handed back my paper and he said, it's a good paper, it's just not a philosophy paper. <clears throat> and instead of telling me what a philosophy paper should look like or what that meant, he sort of nudged me to the place where all the other students had gotten their ideas, the Encyclopedia of Philosophy. So I went there and I copied some stuff down about St. Anselm's proof of the existence of God, which I cared not at all about, still don't care about, uh, but I got my paper done. So that was a philosophy paper. Um, that was also the last philosophy course I ever took. <laughs> um, a little further along in college, I took an art history course. I, I didn't major in art history, but I liked it, and I had taken this class that was fairly upper division, and it was cross-listed with graduate programs, so I had a lot of graduate students in the room with me. And I got really into mimicking their pompousness and their sort of wordy, nerdy, you know, art historian thing that they were doing. And I thought, that's kind of cool. I can do that, too. So I did this big research paper, and I had fun with the research. But when I actually wrote the paper, I was really writing with my tongue in cheek, just seeing how many big words I could string together. And I even had the longest title I could come up with. Hiberno-Saxon Eusebian Canon Tables and their East Mediterranean Prototypes. <laughs> it, was, it just made me laugh to say that. You know, I could say that. Um, and I got an A, so that was good. And I knew that I could really be a really good imposter if I wanted to be. Uh, but I thought it was all kind of stupid, to be honest with you, that to, to do that. Now, my actual major was Russian literature, as you say, because as it turns out, if you like reading big, fat novels, perfect major, perfect major for you. I never got really very good at Russian grammar or syntax, and I still could never do the verbs of motion. Forget it, it's impossible. But we read a lot of books in translation, so that was okay. And I took this course from a teacher who had written books about Dostoevsky, and it was a course, it was a survey course, and we were reading lots and lots of Dostoevsky, and this, that was great, I love Dostoevsky. So, I got in trouble though, because we got to this point where we reached, she was kind of chronologically going through his works, and we got to my favorite book of all time, The Idiot, and he skipped it. He said, I don't get this book. This book just does not fit into the, the canon. I don't know what he was trying to do. It doesn't make any sense. I don't like this book, so we're going to just move on. And I was really <sighs> upset because this is the best book ever. And I just, you know, I went up to him afterwards and I'm like, Roger, I think you're an idiot yourself because this is, this is fabulous. This, is, this book, just, it just means everything you want to know about Dostoevsky is in this book. And he said, great, you can write your paper about it. Explain it to me. Okay. <laughs> well, unfortunately, while I was absolutely certain that the book was full of meaning, I, I didn't know what it was. <laughs> so I had a really hard time getting started with this. Uh, I looked at everything that I could find in the library about the idiot, and none of it got it right. It didn't, nobody was putting their finger on whatever it was that was so important. So I stared at the book, and I stared at the blank page, and I stared at the calendar and I thought, I have to start writing because you know, I, I, I don't know what I'm going to say, but I, it's due, so start writing. And as soon as I started to, and I was writing like this <laughs> in those days, as soon as I started to write, this great idea came to me. And it was the writing that kind of unlocked that for me. Because uh, the stakes were really high. Um, but I found there was this painting referred to in the novel and everything connected to that painting. And once I got that idea, it just started to flow. And it was just, it was fantastic. It was, it was intoxicating to write this paper because it really, really mattered. At least it was intoxicating until it came time to type it, which <laughs> was not so fun. 
a bucket of white out on one side. Type right yeah. <laughs> Some of you are old enough to remember those things. But anyway, I had to reserve time to type it. But up till then, it was just awesome to be able to write that paper. And, and it mattered. It mattered in a way nothing else I had written ever did. I liked writing papers. I was good at writing papers. But this one was different. And when the teacher told me that it gave him new insights into the novel and that uh, a new way to think about it, that meant more to me than any grade I'd ever earned. Because I felt a sense of agency that I'd never had before. As a librarian, I want our students to have that moment of recognition, of self-recognition. I matter. I'm part of this. This is a conversation that includes me. Research isn't about finding the answers. It's about asking questions that may not have an answer until you put your mind to it. And when students have that moment, and many of them do, and sometimes you get to see it, which is really cool, that's a time when, for them, the whole world pivots. They're in a completely different place than they were before that. They see themselves differently. They recognize their role in the world of ideas. They join the conversation. And that, to me, is the greatest reward of being an academic librarian. I want to help faculty invite students to that moment. I want to make the library a site of transformation. I want to change the metaphors. So what metaphors am I talking about? Well, we tend to think of information as stuff that is manufactured somewhere else. It's stuff that we acquire and we store and we exchange. It's, it's a very valuable commodity. And the most successful libraries are the ones that provide an efficient and pleasant customer service as people get their hands on these goods. So students come into the library to shop for sources, which are full of nutritious authority. And if they're really good at it, they'll pick the right kinds of ingredients. This is all authority that rests outside of themselves. They have to go get it from someone else. And the library's website is a more or less confusing shopping platform for them, for those nuggets of authority that they're supposed to get and bring back to their teachers. And faculty and administrators fall into this trap, too. They tend to see research as monetizable stuff. There are publications. When faculty make publications, these are tokens of productivity. They're proof that they count. Um, and those can be exchanged for job security, for grants, for prestige. It's a very individualistic kind of an enterprise. So students are consumers, faculty are, are brands to be developed, and this whole idea about education is that it's either an industry or it's an investment, depending on whether you're a producer or a consumer. So it's all about production and consumption. So let's back up for a minute and think about how the cultural significance of the libraries evolved over time, because these, these metaphors, these images, actually can tell us a lot about our underlying beliefs. So go back to the blank screen here. Um, and I'm drawing on the works of Scott Bennett, who many of you have probably read some of his articles and things. Um, he talks about the development of libraries as over time, that early on as a, a kind of a monastic place with a reader at the center. Um, books were rare, they were, they were scarce, and the person who was able to contemplate things alone was at the center of the library in that tradition. Usually a guy, as it happens. And then in the 19th century, at least in the United States, the library became a kind of a civic project, interestingly enough, mostly run by women. Uh, or at least the, the movement was, was motivated by women who worked hard to make this happen. Um, so this was a place that welcomed all comers in order to help them become better educated. And there's this interesting mix uh, of images in, in that public library. It's their populist, their domestic, and also enlightenment messages, which invited everybody to the library, but inscribed over the door the people who they were supposed to read. So it's kind of a mixed message. Um, the Boston Public Library has, in addition to its iconic free to all message, um, there is also an inscription. The Commonwealth requires the education of the people as the safeguard of order and liberty. So that's kind of an interesting mix. The library is there to preserve order and to promote liberty, to promote freedom. And I can see how libraries actually fit into that. 
because libraries seem very orderly. We establish a certain kind of order. We put all these books neatly together on the shelf that don't agree with each other, but they're all right there, so they can have a good brawl right on the shelf. Um, and you think, you know, it's, it's calm, but there's actually a lot going on in there. We want these conflicting ideas to be right next to one another. And then in the mid-20th century, the glory of the library, at least the academic library, was that it was really, really big. And the bigger, the better. Now, around, I don't know, the 1980s or 90s, we began to um, think instead about access as opposed to ownership, because we kept adding on to these libraries and it cost too much. So we decided that wasn't important to have this stuff, but access still was really important. And we still had this kind of thing about bigger going on because it wasn't physically in the library, but the more full text titles we had, the better. Uh -huh. um, and here's where I depart a little bit from Scott Bennett. He was thinking about the, the, the current library, the new thing is to become student center, reader centered again. And yet I, I'm concerned about how we become kind of the wallet that pays for stuff people need. Um, so we also, at this time, started to take our cues from Barnes and Nobles, because our students were going there and it was freaking us out. Because they took our decor, you know, these traditional library type architectural motifs, and put them in their bookstores. And everybody said, that is awesome. I want to go sit in those big chairs. And, <laughs> and so we had to get it back <laughs> from Barnes and Nobles. But we, we talked about it being a great retail experience, how to make it more like a bookstore. Um, and at the same time, we were trying to realize, you know, figure out, wow, we had such boring catalogs, and then Amazon came along, and they figured out people actually like catalogs, who knew? So we tried also to look like Amazon and Google, and we're still really trying to do that. But our main function was to pay for whatever it was that our customers wanted. So, it's free to all, but authorized affiliated, you know, as defined applicable licenses void upon graduation. <laughs> so, um, thinking about this, this purpose for libraries in terms of uh, these classic 1931 laws of library, we all know this, we can recite these, right? These are classics and they, they've stood the test of time, even though we don't always talk about books now. But they're still pretty valid things. Um, but it seems like we've changed these a little bit information is for sale. Every customer, consumer choice. Every product, market exposure. They're always arguing. Put those things in our library, we will expose them to the market. Improve the customer experience and the library must grow its market or die. <laughs> die. It's pretty bad. So we've so thoroughly absorbed this market-driven philosophy of human behavior that we forget people don't always respond only to those cues. There are other ways human beings have interacted. Y'all in the Northwest, you know this. <laughs> um, you've got cooperatives, you've got people caring about the, the environment, you know, but, but we have to remind ourselves, it's not all about the money, it's not all about consuming. Um, and yet these underlying assumptions, I think have profoundly uh, influenced our thinking about what libraries are for and how they're used. And you can see that, I think, in the, the Library Bill of Rights, which um, it has a lot of different points to it. There are a lot of things that we think are important that are rights for people. And yet we tend to end up thinking about our purpose as connecting users to the information they need. Boom, end of story. Um, we don't spend a whole lot of time explaining why privacy still matters in an era when the commercial web runs on micropayments of personal information. We don't make a case for equitable information access because we're always so busy quibbling over our license agreements for our communities. The most recent Ithaca report on faculty attitudes toward the library showed that the important purpose, the thing that they think is most important about libraries and has gotten more and more important in recent years is basically to pay the bills for the stuff I personally want and need. So unfortunately, we began to think it's our duty and our calling to provide information on demand. And if we don't, we are so duped. We have lost this rich social meaning of libraries when it's all about delivering products to customers. And we hear this kind of 
apocalyptic language all the time. I just did a, a quick Google search and found a whole bunch of things on this theme that we're doomed. <laughs> um, it's, we often think about the future in these dystopian and apocalyptic terms. It's just full of death threats everywhere you turn. Um, and these key words that you see are used again and again, customers, value propositions, product mix, irrelevance, competition. Now, when I look around my library, I probably see what you see, which is students who are using the library. They're, they're, they're studying, they're talking to each other, they might be snoozing, uh, they're searching, they're studying. They're not looking nervously over their shoulder expecting imminent chaos. <laughs> They're not expecting that asteroid to hit any minute now. Um, they use Google and they use Amazon, but they don't think of them as being in competition with the library. They like the library. The library belongs to them. They like it because it's the college's common ground. And sharing, the sharing that happens in libraries, the sharing they want to do, it makes perfect sense to them. Similarly, we often hear that there's something sort of intrinsically tragic about commons. Like libraries are almost by definition doomed, except when we look around and see that actually they aren't. I mean, how many of you have heard tragedy of the commons used at some point in library discourse? Yeah, that comes up a lot. Um, this comes from Garrett Hardin's uh, very influential essay in Science, published in 1968. Have, have you gone back and read this lately? The guy was a lunatic. <laughs> it's really interesting to read because it, it's a phrase that comes so easily you know, to your tongue, tragedy of the commons. What it was about was the threat of overpopulation. And what his concern was, was that people are A, inherently selfish, that's what motivates them, and B, we're really not very good at letting poor people's babies die. And that's how you know, we would normally control um, this population growth problem, but since we kind of support people and they don't die, well, they have a vested interest in populating, and this is all, of course, in the third world. Um, so rather than letting nature take its course and letting those poor babies die, um, the, the lower classes end up taking advantage of this conundrum to overbreed for their own aggrandizement, he said. Um, he was arguing we couldn't rely on the access to birth control, which at the time was kind of new, um, to solve this problem because people just won't do the right thing. Um, or as he put it succinctly, freedom to breed will bring ruin to us all. I mean, this is just an amazing essay when you read it. So to make this point, he, he talked about um, how grasslands and fisheries could be depleted if individual interests collide with the common good and the, the ability to promote sustainability. And there he had a point, and some of the things he said were, were absolutely accurate. Um, but fundamentally, he was bringing this up to make an argument that people just can't share wisely, and so their behavior has to be regulated by the state or by private interests. Now, more recently, Eleanor Ostrom is an economist who's come along and studied successful commons because she didn't believe this, and she wanted to see how they worked, and could people actually regulate themselves as a community, and in fact, they can, as it turns out. Um, and she got a Nobel Prize for some of that work. But another thing about this that's interesting is she says, when you have these limited resources, people can still figure it out and sustain them. They can look beyond their personal self, immediate self-interest and do this. But we're still talking about the kinds of commons that will be depleted if they're not taken care of. Um, and what's interesting to me is that really libraries aren't even in that category. There's, these are not a commons that will be depleted because ideas are inexhaustible. And this is something that Thomas Jefferson actually uh, commented on a long, long time ago when he was talking about should the state give monopolies to inventors. If nature has made any one thing less susceptible than all others of exclusive property, it's the action of a thinking power called an idea. He who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine, as he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening me. That ideas should freely spread from one another all over the globe for the moral and mutual instruction of man and improvement of his condition seems to have been 
peculiarly and benevolently designed by nature, like the air in which we breathe, move, and have our physical being, incapable of confinement or exclusive appropriation. Doesn't that just sound like just shivers down your spine? So the tragedy of the commons, I would argue, isn't that people are inherently selfish and will spoil it for everyone given the chance. It's that we think commons are impossible. They're unaffordable. They're inevitably subject to ruin through greed and selfishness. And that in that spirit, I think our commons have become enclosed, our intellectual commons, made into private property, made artificially scarce. But let's remember that this isn't really even the free market at work. It's not like it's between groups of people cooperating versus the free market operating. This has really nothing to do with the free market. This is like agribusiness, okay? This is like um, artificially popping up the information industries so they can do this, <laughs> lock the door on people. Um, and we know that what we're doing is unhealthy and unsustainable, um, and yet it's too big. It feels like it's too big to stop. I think it was really, really symbolic when the APA changed their citation rules, the most recent um, version of how to cite things, and said, you know what, if you have a DOI that the publisher supplies, that's good. Use that. If you don't, make sure you point to the publisher's website. I mean, this is insane. You know? And you're supposed to say, retrieved from this website, when you know that's a lie. I mean, who would pay $40 for that article? No way. But that's what you're supposed to do. Well, the APA is a major publisher, and they think publishers are the source of knowledge, and they are the custodians of knowledge. We're just local distributors. We're just little franchises that kind of distribute this stuff for people. And this, to me, is a shift in the metaphor that is really shocking. And it's a significant shift. And I think we need to reclaim and reopen the commons of knowledge. Now, another key word that has been getting a lot of play in the last couple of decades is change. Uh, often change is held over us as an immediate threat, like those poor dinosaurs, or this book, <laughs> Change or Die. It's something that comes from outside that we have to prepare for before it's too late. It's a threat that divides the ready and the unready. Some people will make it, some people won't. Um, in higher education, as you may have noticed, change is posed as this kind of natural force that results in a time of scarcity. So we're told that we have to change because we are inefficient, we're too expensive, we're, we can't compete. Uh, we're going to be overtaken and replaced by more nimble competitors. And this is a, a kind of narrative of fear and austerity that's been used to make competition seem like the natural law of the universe somehow. Um, an uh, inescapable force that is going to redirect public funds into private pockets and dismantle public institutions in order to shift our common wealth into the control of individuals and corporations who, just by definition, are going to do a much better job of managing it than we are. Now, we don't really have to let this happen. Yes, of course we know there are changes happening. There's changes happening all the time. But they don't have to be defined that way. I, I realized maybe this is not a great slide because I see there's something on the, in Portland, the Portland newspaper about panhandlers. So <laughs> I don't know how you feel about that, but anyway, I like this, I like this image. This isn't really about um, getting resources. This is, this is about actual change. So um, we don't really have to just listen to it as if this change is coming from outside. We have to get in line with it. If you remember, the fifth of Ranganathan's laws is really all about change. It's about organic change, Ch change that happens naturally, that happens continually in libraries. Because the library is a living thing. It's not just stuff. Corporatization and commodification isn't inevitable. Our traditional values, our commitment to sharing and equality and openness are, I think, exactly what this frightened patterned world needs right now, and we can be agents of change. Now this is where everybody's saying, oh yeah, right. <laughs> um, I, I gave a talk not too long ago in Pennsylvania, and I was doing all these big idea things, and, and afterwards people were like, well, I really liked what you said, but we're librarians. We don't have any power. 
power? How can you do any of those things? Um, well, I think that's not entirely true, although I can sympathize. I can sympathize with that impulse. Um, I just think it's inaccurate, actually. We have bigger budgets than most academic programs have. Uh, we have collectively enormous financial clout. We also have, if you want to keep talking in these capitalistic terms, we have a lot of cultural capital in libraries. And that I think we overlook all the time. People think libraries are awesome. They think they're wonderful. They believe in what libraries stand for. And um, that's something we overlook, I think. We even have some hipster cachet because remember as FBI agent, called us radical militant librarians in the New York Times. <laughs> that helped a lot, right? Um, as I was um, just this morning catching up with my, my Twitter friends, um, I was reminded of something that seems to fit here, actually. This is the 10th anniversary of the death of Paul Wellstone, who was um, a US senator. He was he, uh, a college professor. He taught political science and decided he wasn't going to just teach it. He was going to live it. And he ran for Congress and he won, which was amazing, except, you know, Minnesota is the place that also elected Jesse Ventura as their <laughs> governor. So things can happen in Minnesota that are unexpected. But this was a good thing. Um, and then um, he really believed that people could make a difference and that people could get together and, and solve problems on this local level. So he kind of combined. You know, the, the rules for radicals that Saul Alinsky used to try to mobilize people and say, what is it you need? What are the issues that are confronting you? How can we solve them? So this very practical grassroots thing with another trend which was toward examining values and trying to organize around, uh, around values and put those together and actually get people to use the system and change it and, and work on problems that are solvable. Uh, and it just seems like a good time to remember him. He, he's, uh, they still have workshops that are done from this Wellstone Foundation or whatever it is, where people get together and learn how to make change and how to get together and organize because, you know, he believed it was actually doable. And there aren't that many people these days, especially in this election season. It's really nice to remember that at least this, a few people have faith in the system enough to think, you know, it doesn't have to be bought and sold. We actually can make a difference. So I think um, we, what we need to do is think about what our values really are and talk about them out loud and put them into practice in our everyday work. And one way that I think we should think about this is in our own workplaces. How do we live the change we'd like to see? We need to, in our own libraries, honor intellectual freedom and inclusion, and taking risks in the service of knowledge, of being open to conflict, and, and caring about questions that don't have easy answers, both in our libraries and on our campuses. Um, these are the things we stand for. We should be doing these things. We should be critical of the systems that we have come to feel are just inexorable, and we need to question them. I think another world is possible, and we can start that right at home. The traditional library hierarchy is, you know, the old one where there's the director and usually there's, there's in the people. Um, that's kind of like a factory floor model. It never really fit libraries, but it's kind of how a lot of organization charts still look. Decisions get made up here, they're executed down here. Um, that obviously is, is a strange fit these days, so a lot of library directors um, have decided they're going to change that, but I think they tend to get their ideas from the Wall Street Journal and the Harvard Business Review because <laughs> they often are bringing in these kind of business-like ideas. Um, and so while we're busy building teams and throwing fish, and <laughs> wondering where did our cheese go? <laughs> we, we do all of those things without looking at something that's really close to home, right in front of us, which is the way that scholars almost effortless, effortlessly seem to work together as peers embarked on a common, sometimes contentious, but common task. Michael Polani is a uh, philosopher of science who has described, described science as a republic as a kind of a political body, but like a republic. And this is a republic in which each citizen can raise their own questions 
and they're hoping to fill in some piece of a puzzle that everybody is working on together. But they're all equals, and they're all contributing in some way. And I think that's not just true of science. I think that's true of knowledge in general. Now, if we were to treat one another as equals, as members of a community, rather than members of work teams, or departments, or whatever, I think we would have a much better chance as social organizations of rehearsing and living our values. Bethany Nowitzki wrote this wonderful piece about digital humanities uh, last August, which um, really moved me. And she wrote this, she gave this talk at a time when it was clear that the whim of a few top administrators could almost bring down a major public institution. I don't know if you were following what was happening at the University of Virginia last August, but uh, a few trustees who read the Wall Street Journal thought they knew what the answer was for this old-fashioned organization. They didn't realize they actually are very hip to digital things. It was a huge crisis, and the campus rose up, and they actually were successful in restoring at least some kind of a balance there. But this is what she um, wrote, and one of the things she said I think would make a great tattoo. <laughs> Existential <laughs> threats don't scare us, we're librarians. <laughs> Which is actually a good reminder, you know, we have coped with a lot of change. We've man made it work. We forget how good we are at this kind of thing. Um, but she really, she went on to talk about why digital humanities belong in libraries. And I think what she says actually applies to all kinds of work done in libraries. She wrote, the extent to which we can have an effective prospect on the future depends on our continued ability to do retrospective work. And this means not only preserving our collections and thinking carefully about ways we remediate them, but it also means understanding what it is to make and build and transmit and share what, in fact, it means to transmit knowledge by making and building. We make things because that's how we understand. We make things because that's how we pass them on. And because everything we have was passed on to us as a made object, we make things in digital humanities because that's how we interpret and conserve our inheritance, because that's how we make it all new. So as we do this work, as we defend our most important values, we need to remember these aren't just our values as librarians, these are shared values. They're bigger than our buildings, they're bigger than our profession. I always like this side. <laughs> We're not the only ones who think that. Uh, this was from the Rally to Restore Sanity. Anyway, I loved it. Um, values are like ideas. They aren't depleted by sharing. We don't have to worry that we're in competition for market share with Google when what we're promoting is our values. They can be shared endlessly. So, what could that maybe look like in actual practice? For the student, maybe we could help them stop thinking in terms of producing papers and instead help them to become passionate about ideas, about ideas that they want to share. We can work with faculty on helping students frame inquiry as conversation, as an invitation to authentic learning rather than transcription of other people's ideas. And this is so much more inviting than Ten double spaced pages using five scholarly sources, which is often what they're focused on. And we have a lot of power to help make that change because we see students at work, we see them going through this process, and we can help faculty learn from our observation. Also, they're really tired of reading those papers. So if we can help them help students do something a little more meaningful, I think they would be grateful to us for that. It is possible. For our faculty, I think they also feel somewhat trapped in this productivity problem that they're in. And we can help them shift the conversation <coughs> from being productive individuals to being active citizens in a republic of knowledge. They really want their work to matter, not just to count toward their productivity quotas. This is possible. For librarians, I think we can change our public identity from being a purchasing agent and a middleman delivering product to uh, these commodities from these vast agribusinesses to the consumer, and think maybe more about a metaphor like being a master gardener, uh, a gardener who helps cultivate our local gardens with an eye on the health of our global knowledge ecosystem. For the library itself, the, the buildings, the places, we can stop treating it as a kind of a retail outlet and shopping platform and instead make it our community's common ground, 
a local note in a global knowledge commons. What's daunting, I think, is that we are individuals and we're small organizations struggling to provide day by day against enormous odds and against this dominant narrative of our time. Recent, a, a couple of years ago, I went to a workshop on libraries and publishing and I got massively depressed because it just seemed like I was realizing these problems are so big and entrenched and the solutions that people had were so tiny and so ineffectual. Um, and we were talking a lot about procedures and plans. And, uh, and we were, it, was, it was just very depressing. I felt like this is just not going to work. How are we going to make this work? Um, but I realized pretty quickly that I have to believe in change, and I have to believe in it incrementally and in small ways, if that's what it takes. Um, so I'm trying to make a difference in very small ways at my very small library, trying to live our, my values, our values. And these can be exercised on a very small and human scale. Um, one thing we did at my library, for example, I, know, I knew from being on the personnel committee that our faculty write these amazing statements when they go up for promotion and tenure. They talk about their teaching and their scholarship and they're just wonderful, wonderful documents that nine people read. <laughs> so I, I found out about this new publishing platform, Pressbooks. It's a word-based platform where you can put in this stuff and it turns into a book. It's really cool. It's an ebook. It's a PDF. It's a website. And it was really easy to do. So I, I got some volunteers. They all agreed to a Creative Commons license and we published it so that anybody can read these things now. Um, just a little thing, but it was something that we could do. Um, another thing we're doing right now is starting a zine collection, a circulating zine collection. And maybe this is old hat here <laughs> on the West Coast. But for us, it was kind of like, awesome. Uh, and it was really to kind of show there is an alternative to alternative ways to publish and also to provide access to alternative voices and, and just invite students to see that they could be part of this DIY culture. And while I was getting ready for this, I was doing some reading about zines. And one of the things um, that I came across um, was from Doris. Uh, which is um, Cindy Crabb's long-running zine, and, and I particularly liked her anti-depression guide. I thought we needed that sometimes. Um, but she, at the end of this collection of her zines, said this, uh, and it's, she called it her introduction. She has an introduction and an introduction. Um, and she wrote, do you believe in happy endings? Because sometimes they do happen. Something inside shifts, something outside comes together and your fight becomes more purposeful, your rest becomes more restful, your hurt becomes something you can bear, and your happiness becomes something that shines out with ease, not in lightning manic bursts that fill and then drain you, but something else, something steady, something you can almost trust to stay there. And this speaks to me because I think we need to nurture that kind of hope, and that kind of sense that I can make a difference. Um, there's a, a critic who's written a book about zines, Alison Peepmeyer, who praises Cab's, Crab's refusal to become cynical, and at the same time her refusal to take complicated things and oversimplify them. She talks about her, her work and the way that she's lived her life as micro-political pedagogies of hope which just saying to me, I really like that phrase. <coughs> and this is the kind of pedagogy that Paulo Freire also advocated for, not the, the banking concept of education where all knowledge belongs to these people and if you go to school, they will deposit it in your brain and you have nothing at all but to say for yourself or any way to affect it. And he was saying, no, we need, we need a different kind of liberating education. Um, and he calls that the practice of freedom. Uh, which is, of course, what libraries are for. It's what liberal education is about. Libraries are a perfect place to practice freedom, to gain agency, and to learn how to hope. What Elizabeth Eisenstein was actually talking about when she was talking about the pr printing press wasn't that it, it was a brand new industry, or that it had new supply chains, yay, or that it was a disruptive innovation. She wasn't really that interested in the technology or in the, the, the economic implications of this new technology. Uh, rather, what interested her was that this change enabled people 
to rediscover the past, the shared past. They were able to read the classics. They were able to read sacred texts. They were able to put the different editions next to each other and compare them. They were able to read a book and know that somebody else, somewhere else, was reading the same book. And they, they could talk to each other across a distance about the same book. That in one room, you could have a whole lot of these books together in conversation. And that a room just like that was springing up in that part of Europe and over there and over there, that these were beginning to grow. And what she argued was that, yeah, it was a nifty technology and it helped free people up so that they didn't have to copy text. It copied for them. How cool is that? But what it did was it gave them the freedom to write new ones. And that combination of freedom to do new things and broad access to ideas that had come before is what she argues led to the Reformation and to the Enlightenment and all those revolutions that happened after that. This was really a revolutionary thing in every sense of the word. But what the printing press did was do what we do. It preserves the past. It allowed people the opportunity to build on it. It made these ideas accessible. And today, those things are really at risk as knowledge becomes intellectual property, as our, our shared intellectual commons becomes enclosed. We know what's at stake. We know what our values are. And we know another world is possible. And I think we can be the change that we want to see. <laughs> so that's that. Let's do this instead. Um, and I, I think, I know there's these kind of weird tectonic plates that are shifting, whereas there's the old business of selling stuff, like selling special memberships in this really cool club, and getting ahead, and investing in your education, and all that, colliding with a newer idea, which is really not that big of an improvement, um, which is coming out of the Silicon Valley way of things, which is, seems really exciting and open, and gosh, people wear pajamas to work. That's really so neat. Um, they're really thinking differently. But they're really thinking about making money, and then they're just thinking about making it in a different way. Um, and so for them, access is something that you can use to do other stuff. But it, there really is this whole kind of libertarian streak in that way of thinking, which I think is contrary to what we should be doing. So when uh, you know, these massive open online courses come out, everybody runs, ah, Google's coming. <laughs> uh, kind of the way that we were when we were first like, oh my god, Wikipedia is so awful. We got to stand it out. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's a different way of doing things. And people get very excited about it. But it isn't, we have to still you know, keep our heads and realize that what matters isn't all this exchange of value that's happening around higher education, but really try to hold on to what really matters. And I think, I mean, I'm in a private institution. And I hate it that private institutions are doing OK, because public institutions have gotten so expensive. I mean, I think that's awful. I don't like being as cheap as the other. You know, I mean, it's just, ah, that's horrible. <laughs> 
Um, so, yeah. I, and I'm not quite sure what to do about it other than to keep committing to what it is that education really means. It's not about, it's not about investing in something that will pay off. It's not about private membership benefits. It, we somehow have to tell this story better. We have to help people recognize what it is that we do that's so valuable for everybody. And that it's, and that we don't need all these country club things. And that really chasing after students as if they are this, um, you know, this income stream is destructive for everybody. So, and I don't know how to do that except that maybe when we're so reduced that there's nothing we're doing but teaching a few students, that will become the thing that we do again and that people will care about because it will, it will actually matter. Um, but it, it's, it's difficult, it's really tricky. And I think this current um, narrative, which is driven largely by, I mean, you know, this happened partly with Occupy, where people were saying, we cannot pay these debts anymore. It's kind of like the, the it's a, a, a bubble like the, the housing market where it's collapsing and now people are saying, what are we getting for this? And how are we gonna get this? And we let that happen and we haven't really quite figured out how to tell the story that we need to tell about education. Um, I think our students can tell that story. Uh, I just wish our administrators would listen. <laughs> so I don't know if that helps. Does anybody else have any thoughts on that or um, a, a rallying cry or <laughs> a way that we can do this? Because I'm not quite sure what it is, but it, it is an interest. It is really a storytelling issue in some ways, um, and I think. Um, you know, a few years ago I was at a, a meeting, it was actually, although I'm not in a union, it was the AFT um, invited me to speak about blogging with some other people. And it was really interesting to see how they were talking. There, there were some people from Washington saying, this is what we're hearing. This is all we hear from our constituents, college costs too much. And that, you know, it was already becoming a really hot issue for legislators. Now, oddly enough, the answer isn't let's reduce the cost by actually funding public institutions. That didn't seem to occur to them. <laughs> um, but I think we kind of let, let other people tell this story, which is really false and, and scary. So, yeah. Yeah, Barbara. Exactly. Um, this, this question is about e-books. There's the e-books that people get on Amazon and just you know, be happy with your expired yeah. Uh, Kindle. Yeah. Uh, but then there's the ebooks that libraries are buying. Uh, that, you know, if you buy yours, I can't borrow it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's like happening and it keeps, uh, I mean, that's changing the conversation. And I, I don't know, like, what can I say about that? What can I do about that? I, ha I have issues with that. For, I'm kind of lucky that I'm at a residential college and the students do not want ebooks. And they aren't asking for them, so I don't. I have that luxury of not actually facing this question. Um, I, I have a real problem with the idea that we will not have any actual owned things that we can share. Yeah. Um, and I think we're about to replicate the big deal problem with monographs, and that you know, university presses, of course, are going to jump in on this and say, "Well, this is our safe library." And you know, when I hear why people want to do this, it's we won't have to spend time making choices that might not be right. Uh, we won't have to you know, devote shelf space. People will be able to just go in and get what they want. Well, I don't know, I mean, some of you work with graduate students, maybe they know what they want, undergraduates. I mean, I may not pick the right books for them, but they really need to just kind of dip in and out of books. If you're gonna pay every time they open a book, which is kind of what you do in a lot of these ebook rental things or ebook PDA things, um, it just becomes another commodity. And then they become just like, oh, I have to go find a quote. I'll open this book. Oh, there's a quote. Ooh. Um, which isn't what they're for. I mean, it's not what libraries are for. So I don't know. I feel like a real curmudgeon on this topic, but it bothers me. And one of the things we do, because our students aren't asking for them, <laughs> is that we actually catalog open access books. There are a lot of really good books being published in open access format. And so we put them if there are things that we think our students would be interested in, we catalog them and put in a little line. You know, if you want a printed copy, let us know, because often they don't want to read it on the screen. Um, but I th I'm hoping that the open access monograph alternative will open up and we'll have more chances to do that. And I think maybe the faculty, the, you know, the, the 
the authors of these things are beginning to pick up on the idea that maybe it would be better to be read <laughs> than just, you know, published. I was at, at that same <laughs> that same depressing conference I was at. There were some people from university presses, and one of them, maybe just to get my goat, said, "I don't understand all this talk about readers. I mean, really, what? It's not about readers. It's you know, this is what faculty do. They do scholarship and they publish it. End of story. I mean, you really didn't get why anybody would want to read that stuff, <laughs> but publishing it was really, really important. And so, I yeah, <laughs> there seemed to be a real disconnect." That, that that's where the discussion turned because I feel like the most, I feel actually kind of invigorated by your talk so far and encouraged. Good. Because I feel like I'm standing, like personally, I'm standing against a lot of things that are happening through our library or on our campus. And what I felt like you were saying earlier is we don't have to be a friend of publishers. Yeah. We don't have, we're not their friends. Mm -hmm. We're not their little helpers. And <laughs> When authors go to the people, like yeah. what is happening in every other realm of entertainment, we don't have to stand between that. Mm -hmm. I, that's exciting to me. And we can do the curatorial work that we actually kind of know how to do and metadata and other stuff like that. We can do that. We can help. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I guess I think it's also really important to think about what we can do and, and rather than just what do we want to not do have happen or what's wrong with this picture. Because when you start focusing on the problem, it's just so big and crushing and discouraging. But if you think of, I can do this, I can make that change, I can make this happen, then, then it makes it, it just makes the fight easier. So I think there's well, I experience a real dilemma there. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking about this, I, I taught a class or I went to a class and did a session on the hacker ethic. And I'm talking about empowering ourselves to control our environments through learning about the technology. Mm -hmm. And then the other part of that is a big part of what I do as a professional is, you know, I am one of the people who reads the vendor agreements. I know what we purchase. You read those? Oh. <laughs> yeah. And so in, in your talk, I see a connection to a lot of those things. Mm -hmm. But what, I, what I'm curious about, or what I didn't see, is the, the pushback from the other side. I mean, one thing that I don't teach students or other people how to do is you can get information without going through publishers. Mm -hmm. You can, I mean, almost anything that's, a, that's, that's the big revolution that everyone is afraid of. And that's what we don't see because we have this very serious responsibility to uh, understand these agreements that we've signed. We don't have a moral right to the items that we purchased. Yeah. We have an agreement we signed and mm -hmm. we are parts of that agreement. But on the other side, there is real change. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. No, and I, you know, I mean, in little ways, like when a, a student says, oh, I, how come I can't get this article? You know, well, we'll get it for you and pay this huge, crazy fee, or you could write to the author. Oh, okay. <laughs> ah, I got the article, yay. <laughs> um, yeah. I actually, this was the first year when I did a class where I was talking about publishing and the, and the you know, all these conundrums, things that are happening, and, and the fact that you don't really own e-books and that they could be changed. That, you know, that mentioning the 19, famous 1984 thing with Amazon, and this was the first time a student said in response to that, ah, you could get a torrent of it, <laughs> you know? And, that, you know, before that, it, they really, they might not have told me that <laughs> you could do that, or, or that it wasn't so widespread that they thought books like music, I can go get those things. So that student was saying that's the future, and you know, um, what do we do about that? I don't know. I don't want to become just a total black market, <laughs> but I think when it's there, right? And when you when you when you talk to faculty about their their agreements, you know, and and, and my son's a physicist, and we were talking about it, sort of say, oh, nobody takes that seriously. It's not. I mean, yeah, of course I sign it, but uh, you know. But he's used to be also posting it to archive, and he knows anybody who wants it can get it because that's how physicists roll. But he doesn't think about it from our perspective that you know you know what you shouldn't sign that agreement. You should you should cross that out. You should make a change. But but yeah, I think a real sticking point in getting people to uh, sign over for like yeah. full, uh, open access. I don't do that anyway. Yeah, right. I know. What's the problem? And, you know, or you get these these these. You sign those crazy agreements. I promise I won't do anything, and you know they, they 
you totally control me, you know, uh, firstborn child here. Um, and yet, then they, they have the plan format where it says, send it to a friend. You can't send it through interlibrary loan, but send it to a friend. And that's just kind of this myth that, you know, we're there on the side of the author who's knowledge, you know, it's just like, but we're stuck in the middle knowing what's really going on. So I think we need to, um, and, and I think faculty are getting it. I mean, the, 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 the success of the Cost of Knowledge Project and the, the failure of the art of it, this down in flames RWA fate was just awesome, you know, because people were really saying, what, this is crazy. <laughs> And, and for the publishers to show their hand like that was a huge tactical blunder because they were saying, we, this is our stuff. We're the ones who do this, you know. And the authors were all saying, oh, like hell. I mean, I wrote that. I can do that. So, you know, it made a big difference. Um, and I think the more people recognize that the system is not working, the better. I mean, I have a, I have a chemist. Chemists are the worst. <laughs> Sorry. They really are. But they just don't get it. But, um, he, he writes all these review essays, and that means he needs a lot of stuff that we don't have. So we are paying these crazy fees for this Elsevier journal, which is the journal that publishes this one thing that he really needs. It's not like a fun Google thing, I'll just go to that journal instead. Well, he finally said, I'm never reviewing for them again. Uh -huh. like, Yo, yay, one step forward, now just stop writing this stuff. <laughs> Yeah, so I think I think maybe we're on the cusp of this, and I think that the idea that the, the we we need to make sure we don't come off as this is a library issue. It's not. This is this is about all of us. This is about knowledge. This is about the stuff you need and the stuff you write. Um, and throwing money at the library is not going to make it any better, because that's the other argument you get. It's just oh well, if libraries just had enough money, it wouldn't be an issue. Well, no. Don't give me any more money. <laughs> Stop doing things this way. We can do this differently. So, you know, I think that's, that's an inter we're at an interesting point there. Yeah. sure you can try this at home. Um, <laughs> but we, we had a, a kind of a dysfunctional situation and we were faculty and the, the solution we proposed was to act like a department because technically we were an academic department. Why couldn't we just behave like one? We're, we have six librarians and we argued that we just can't afford to have a director because that's like having an admiral and a dinghy, you know? Do we really need that? Metals and a gray, you know, sinking the boat. Um, and and uh, we got away with it somehow, but what we do now is we elect a chair and all of us are involved in all the decisions to the extent that we, we, we're, we know what's going on. And the chair is the person who interacts with authority with the provost and uh, just kind of keeps things going and technically it's the person who's everybody's boss but it turned out we didn't really need to do a lot of bossing. I, I, I was the first chair under this model and I was thinking oh god <laughs> I'm going to be doing personnel all the time because we were at each other's throat. I mean it was just a really bad situation and about six months later the dean I reported to said this is really amazing. I haven't had anyone in my office complaining ever since we did this. So a lot of the being given agency and, and, and being allowed to just you know do their work made a big difference for a lot of people. We still had issues, but um, but people weren't looking to one person to solve them. You know these interpersonal kinds of issues, and people will say, well, how does that? I mean, yeah, how do you deal with problems? 
Well, how do you deal with problems in any other organization? Stuff festers for years, right? I mean, it, it's not like having uh, iron-fisted library director fixes all the problems. <laughs> Um, you know, we still have problems, but we work them out, and everybody has permission to be part of working those things out. And there's some little odd, you know, things we have to, um, with hiring, working with HR, they don't get it. They don't, anybody can do these jobs, right? I mean, um, so staff jobs, we always have to fight like hell to make a case for them, although I think we would be doing that anyway. Um, and. It's been interesting too because a lot of the faculty, when we talked about this, and we did this in like 1995, so it's been around a while. Um, if people would take us aside and say, are you sure you want to do this? I don't know if this is going to work. And then it turned out, oh, of course you were worried because your departments are completely dysfunctional. <laughs> um, that's what's going on. You, know, you expect the one chair to do all this stuff and, and you leave them you know, like, that's your business, I'm not going to help you out. We're much more collaborative, and I think libraries are used to that. You know, we share stuff a lot more easily than people in English departments do, for example. Um, so it has worked for us, and, and I've, I've just been in on some conversations of people wondering, how are we going to get new library directors? Where is all the talent coming from? How do we cultivate this? How do we do succession planning? And I'm thinking, what? I mean, we have succession planning. Everybody has to be chair, <laughs> um, you know, and, and uh, we hire, you know, we, people who've been hired since then were hired with the understanding that was going to be their job at some point, and that, you know, just get, you know, if you're not on board with that, then you don't want this job. Um, so we've got people who are all, like, okay with that, and, and yet not, you know, like, thinking that's my step up. Uh, so this whole thing about having these ranks and like, I also was kind of surprised early on in this profession to find that it didn't really matter what ideas you had or what things you accomplished, it was how many people you bossed, how many people reported to you is what really counted. Um, and I think that's just stupid. Because <laughs> most people who work in libraries are really smart people who can do the work without bosses. And they do, actually, most of the time. So um, I don't know if that at all helps. <laughs> going back to that idea that knowledge is made by people acting as peers, working together, um, that that can become a model for a lot of other things. And, and this whole kind of industrialization of research is, is a foreign thing that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So I think if, if we keep going back to that idea that this is stuff that individuals actually create so they can share it, then maybe we can help them figure out that you know the way you're sharing it right now isn't working. So um, you would do this. And I think, at least on our campus, we've always gotten along well with faculty. We are faculty, and they don't, don't draw distinctions. They're, people don't look down their noses at us, um, which helps, I'm sure. Um, but they assume that we're going to be out there and involved with campus affairs, and that we're going to be doing the things that you do in your faculty. You're going to serve on committees. You're going to take on jobs nobody wants. And, um, and you're going to step up. I mean, I have tenure. If I don't use tenure to say what I need to say, because it would be uncomfortable, then I shouldn't have tenure. <laughs> um, and so um, it has really helped with our teaching program, too, because they see us as active scholars, as people who are connected with ideas. We're not just technicians. We're not just trainers. Um, they're, they're kind of puzzled and awed by what we do sometimes. <laughs> But, um, but, but we're, not as, we're not administrators in their minds. And, um, and, and what we do is intellectual work. So that helps. And then it also helps, I think, with students because we're not just helping them become you know, good students who jump through certain hoops and here's how you press the right buttons to do this. Um, you know, we, we are in a position to encourage them to think about their learning differently. Um, a lot depends too, I think, for that in that effort and, and how your faculty, you know, how empowered they feel about teaching. And in our case, we have a, um, a faculty development center 
that's very trusted. It's owned by the faculty. I was director of it for a while. And you know, they have some actual money, which is really nice to throw money at people to get stuff done. But you know, people are used to getting together to talk about teaching this way. They're not thinking that's a distraction. Um, and we're part of that conversation. And I know in other places, it's either librarians feel like the faculty don't care about teaching. I think that's probably not true, but they may see some burned out people. Um, or they feel like they can't really talk to the faculty because the faculty are way up here and the librarians are way down here. And you know, I don't know how, how, how to change those power dynamics other than maybe to pretend they aren't there. I think a lot of the way library organizations that are hierarchical actually operate is not that way at all. It's like once a year there's a performance review and then suddenly everybody's lined up in these hierarchies. <laughs> but otherwise you're just doing your work. And so I think if we could just sort of recognize how artificial those things are, um, that might help. I don't know. I, I, it still just blows my mind when I talk to librarians who have a really cool idea and then say, but I have to go get permission. It's like, well, you're over 18, right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's what I say to them. <laughs> So I, I think it's just you know having confidence, feeling that belief that you have agency, that you matter, um, and that you can maybe not make big changes, but you can at least make these little ones. You know, I don't know. But I, like I say, I'm in a privileged position. I have tenure; they can't fire me too easily. Um, I, I actually kind of had a big mouth before I had tenure, though, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't think it's required. But it, it is something which I think if we, I think we have a lot more job security in many cases than we act on. I mean that we could actually take responsibility for some of these issues um, and are too scared to do that and, and maybe shouldn't be compared to where other people are. Although we've got we have community college sitting in the front row. <laughs> so, any other thoughts? I think we, we get sucked into this, oh, everybody's in a hurry, these poor students, they need this, you know, oh, I'll help you get your five sources, you know, without backing up and questioning that. Um, and so they kind of get led along that path too. Um, and our databases work that way. I mean, we've kind of organized ourselves that way. And, you know, save the time of the reader is great, but save that time so that you can talk about really cool things, not, not so that you can rush off to your next appointment. Um, yeah, yeah, there is, you know, some, some ways of thinking about it as a public sphere and where this really is the place where people hash things out. And the more we can do that, I think the better for all of us. If we can invite faculty into the library to do that too. I mean, it, it's common ground, that, you know, they don't have to feel like somebody has an edge, you know, at work. Okay, you've got branch libraries, sorry. <laughs> but if, if you have this kind of big general library and can bring people together in there, they can find these common places um, to, to collaborate and coalesce and think together. And, and I think they really value that. And we underestimate how important that is. So what she said, oh yeah. I appreciate the uh, discussion that we talked about looking at different ways uh, to get a ton of students to an MLS program and into the engineering program uh, profession and thinking about things that we as libraries are, are proud of. And that's one of the things that our, our library talks about. You know, we're, we're proud of our, of our access that we offer to our students. Mm -hmm. That's something to describe. And, but I, I really appreciate you reframing that and, and the 
maybe the wrong problem. problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and there's some really good research to help with that whole thing, you know, project information literacy, which just came out with a really interesting new report on um, what new graduates experience in the workplace and what employers expect, you know, which speaks totally to this, you know, oh my God, the sky is falling, education has to change. But it really says, you know, what they're looking for is some of the skills we teach, and the students come out with some really important skills, but they're, they don't think of, information is existing in this social context and that really to make better information they need to actually talk to people, maybe pick up the phone. <laughs> um, and that it's something that isn't just, I'll find it, there you go. It's, it's, it's something you work with, you know? It's, it's, um, it's not finished. You don't just get it off the shelf as fast as you possibly can and that freaks them out because they're worried they'll lose their job if they didn't find the answer really fast. And it turns out that's not at all what their employers want. They want them to find stuff really fast, but do it in this more social, nuanced, deeper way. Um, so I think we sell them short, and we're actually setting them up for problems later when we do that. Um, another, um, if you know the Citation Project, which is, um, comes out of the, the writing instruction field, which is very allied to us, and if you ever want to see neat things going on, go there, because they do cool stuff. This is a study of students in their first year and the writing they do, and it was collecting writing on multiple campuses. And what the researchers found is that students will typically grab a quote from the first page of the sources they find. And it may be totally out of context, but it's something they can use. So they think what they're supposed to do is grab a bunch of quotes and put them together with a few little bits of glue in between. Um, and so they were like, oh my god, this is horrible. But you know, do we abet that? Do, if we do these PDAs, are we just doing that again? I'm gonna put in my search terms and find a book that says what I needed to say um, and that I don't have to actually read. <laughs> um, God, I sound like a curmudgeon sometimes. But, <laughs> but I'm not sure that all this emphasis on that kind of writing in the first year is, is good at all. I kind of wish they would stop teaching citations and writing from sources in the first year because they're not ready for that. Okay. <laughs> they need to learn how to read. They need to learn how to think. They need to, how to, to find their own voice. Uh, and they're not doing that. They're, and there was also a study um, done by um, Andrea Lunsford and her daughter, whose name I forget, they did one back in the 80s, mid 80s, and then redid the study recently and found that, contrary to, to legend, students are writing longer papers than they used to do. They were actually studying mistakes students make, um, writing mistakes, kind of very small scale mistakes. But one of the, the side things they found, which I found fascinating, is that they're writing much longer papers than they used to. They're asked to write at greater length and they're much more likely to be writing from sources, writing with quoting sources and using sources than they were in the 80s. Um, and I'm kind of questioning now whether we are actually fostering this kind of smash and grab, I'll get a few facts, throw them out there, just like the debates, you know, I just throw a few things out there and I don't really need to think about them. <laughs> um, and, and always thinking of what they find as Facts they can use as ammunition to lock get somebody else. You know, there's actually this amazing product out there which I almost hate to mention because it is really so cool and it's so awful. It's called Sight Lighter. Have you heard of this? It was written by some former students who kind of knew what problems students find. It's kind of like Zotero but with some writing tools built in, so you can capture um, the facts you need. They call them the facts. Every source is a fact. Um, and it'll keep track of them and you can highlight them and then you can grab those pieces and put them in a document and rearrange them and then add your own thoughts, press a button, and it's a paper. Um, and, it, and it does your citations for you. So I mean, it is really cool, but the way they describe the purpose of writing a paper is just so amazing. It's, it's, um, it's very telling because it really is all about just find a few quotes. And then the other cool thing it does, it's social. So you don't actually have to find your own documents, you just find the quotes other people found and then you put them together. And it, it, will, it will create a nation of empowered learners, it says. <laughs> um, because they'll be able to write these papers really fast. 
and get on to the more important things, which are not writing papers. So, so I think we need to really, and you know, another great set of allies can be the writing professionals at your school because they run into exactly the same issues and they have the same kind of sense of being disenfranchised, but all over the curriculum. So we have a lot of common cause. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking about the writing I think you can find them all over the place, but they're, you know, you have to coax them out a little bit. And maybe, I mean, in our campus, working with the faculty development program is a good way to find these people. Um, the people interested in undergraduate research can be interesting, as long as you don't imply that finding quotes in the library is research, because that annoys them. <laughs> um, but they really care about that piece of learning that gets left out if they are you know, conscious about students and the research they do and how that can actually add this whole dimension to the undergraduate experience. So that would be another group that I would, I would think could be really good advocates. Um, what's funny is they're kind of sprinkled through different departments so that you can't always count on this department will work and that department won't because they don't act that way. They're really very individualistic. So if you can kind of keep your ear to the ground and find the people who seem to really be thinking about what are students learning and how can I make that better. Um, those are great people. And what also works is if you get their ideas and you share them, you know, like they did this great assignment and you let other people know about it, then they get credit for it. But it also is a great assignment because it didn't come from the library. <laughs> it came from another teacher. So um, yeah, there are ways to, to kind of find those allies, which is a little bit like that organizing thing that Wellstone did so well, which is to, to go into a community and figure out, not just, you know, how can I convince these people that my problem is their problem and they can help me solve it, but to figure out what are the things you are trying to do, what are the issues that matter to you, and how can we together make those things better? Um, and I think we can, we can do that too, and become, you know, the place where you go to get your coffee while you talk about revolution. <laughs>